introduce Captain Bernal. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Alyssa Bernal, and I'm currently the captain over at the Larry D. Smith. Clay County was actually incorporated from parts of San Diego and San Bernardino. And as of May, oh, I don't have the date up there. Uh, I think it was May of 1893. Population out here was 13,745. And the birth of the Riverside County Sheriff started with our very first sheriff, Fred Swope. We have definitely grown since then. Currently, the department covers about 7,300 square miles, um, which is 200 miles in length and 50 miles in width. And our population, from last count that I could find, was 2,556,000. So to say that we have grown a little bit might be an understatement. We are currently the fourth largest county in California, and the Riverside County Sheriff's Department is the second largest um, department in California second largest sheriff's department. And then of course we have um, our sh current sheriff, Sheriff Chad Bianco. Right now we stretch around, um, across California from the Colorado River in the east to Norco, Corona, and Wilnabar in the west. Riverside County Sheriff's um, Office provides much of the region's law enforcement via 10 sheriff, well actually, I'm sorry, I think we're up to 11 sheriff stations now um, across the region. We have Cabazon, Hemet, um, and a substation, Lake Hemet Station, Lake Elsinore, Moreno Valley, Paris Station. We also have the Southwest Station, which also has a um, substation in Temecula. Colorado River Station, which is a really nice way of saying Blythe. <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Harupa Valley Station, which has a substation in Norco as well. And then our newest station is Lake Matthews. We also have Palm Desert. San Jacinto, and thermal stations. With that, I would like to introduce my partner. I would say my partner in crime out here, but it probably wouldn't sound right, right? <laughs> I would like to um, introduce my partner in the community, Captain Tim Salas, who is the captain of the Cabazon station. I don't need that. I, I, I don't think I need this thing. If I talk through that, I'll make you all leave here. They're recording. Oh, so okay. You know. Okay. All righty. My name is Timothy Salas. I'm the commander of the Cabazon Station. Well, they talked about all the square miles of uh, Riverside County. Cabazon Station is actually responsible for uh, 900 square miles, and it all surrounds right around where you all are at. And can you change that for me? Okay, if you look over there, that, that's the areas that we go from the Badlands, the Bench, Cabazon. I do have a couple contracts that I'm responsible for. I um, serve as the Chief of Police for the City of Cala Mesa, and I also uh, manage the uh, Morongo Indian Reservation contract. So I have two contracts, then all the other areas that go down there, that's what we have. Jackrabbit Trail, the, we go... All the way up the hill, if you're going towards um, uh, Idlewild, right where Lake Fulmar is, that stops us. If you're going down the 60, when it turns into Moreno Valley over there about Theodore, that's ours. We'll come down to Yucaipa. We go up to the San Bernardino border here, and we go all the way up to North Palm Springs. Windy Point is actually mine, too. So I have several communities there, and like I said, 900 square miles. <clears throat> what my personnel does, the personnel I work with out of our station, we do all the patrol around this area. So uh, anything that is you all belong to the city of Banning, anything outside of the city, any unincorporated area, fall under the Sheriff's Department. <clears throat> and. On the other side of Cherry Valley, over there in Beaumont, and all around. So anything that happens crime-related in the county areas, our staff takes care of that. Right now, th that is our organizational chart from the Sheriff's Department. That shows you how many divisions, like uh, my partner uh, Alyssa told you, is we have right now, I believe it's 12. 12 stations. We have 12 stations, Lake Matthews and Eastvale being just added on. 
we have these stations out, and uh, every station has their own little jurisdiction. A lot of us, what we do in the sheriff's department, we have contract cities. Like in a contract city is where a city, every city that is an incorporated city is required from the state constitution to provide police services. So they could either have their own police department or they could say, hey, guess what, Sheriff? Can you please provide us a police department, which we think is probably the best bang for your buck, and you're going to see why in a second, because once any city, any city decides to contract with the Sheriff's Department, you're not just getting little lonely Cabazon Station with my roughly 78 personnel that work there. You're getting the whole bunch. You're getting everything. And I will go through some slides right now. That's, I, I know Alyssa used the same uh, uh, photograph because I like that photograph because it shows, shows us in a quick snapshot of everything you get from the Sheriff's Department when you move. You get, uh, and I'll tell you one thing, I can't speak enough about our new sheriff. I have been in this department <clears throat> for 33 years, and I've been in law enforcement for 35 years. And I'll tell you, I don't think we've been in a better place than we are now. Our new sheriff, he's got a great vision. He really loves the department and loves the obligation that he took on. And he does a great job for us, and he wants to make us, and I'm pretty sure we're pretty close to being the best agency in the world. I don't even say nation, in the world, because I've seen it, I've lived it, and looking, just, next slide please. We'll go over and we'll talk about some of the things you do. So anyone, anywhere around the area, the city of Banning included, if we get a need for a bloodhound, we have bloodhounds out there. If you see those dogs up there front, we got two kinds of dogs. Well, we actually have more than two kinds of dogs because even a, in Alyssa's shop, she has dogs there too. But the thing is, is we have detection dogs, we have bloodhounds who are scent dogs, and then people don't like calling them this, but down there you got what is called bite dogs. They're not really bite dogs, they're service dogs, they're canines, or they go out there, but they're the police dogs that if they had to, they, they do bite. Understand one thing about it, everybody said canines are so mean. They're not mean. They actually, when they go out to do what they do, take down suspects and everything, they're doing it for one thing and one thing only. Do you know what that is? A treat. They're going out for a treat. They're wagging their tails. It's fun for them to do. And they know once they take down whoever they're required to take down and do whatever they are, and they do it in the most humane way possible because they're saving people's lives really when they do that. Because sometimes if we didn't have that option, we would have to go to a higher level of force. So the dog goes over there, they take them down. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes they do get bike marks on them and everything. But instead of having a bullet or something else, that, that is a better way. And the dog is not a vicious dog. The dog's doing it because that's what it's been trained to do. And they know after they do that, they're going to get a treat. <clears throat> I've had um, plenty of opportunities through my uh, career to be involved in uh, a lot of search and rescue operations. And um, one right here, since I've been here, I've been the commander of Cabazon Station for just a little over four years. And um, we had one up here in the hill where I actually, if I get to a point where my uh, resources, my internal resources of the deputy sheriffs that work for me are not enough, then I just make a phone call, I get, or a radio call, and then I could have our search and rescue come down. We get our helicopters down, we have search and rescue, we have SAR teams, which is search and rescue. We have them uh, throughout the county. Uh, most of the time I use desert uh, search and rescue or the Riverside mountain unit that will come down and I could have them go and deploy into the hills and find out, look for whoever we're, we're looking for. Very good resource and if that's not enough, we could call 
all of the resources from Riverside County. If that's not enough, we call, go to Cal OES and we call more. At one time when I was a lieutenant out of Thermal Station, I brought in, for we were looking for somebody that was lost in a flood, and I brought in 250 searchers. That's the kind of capabilities that this Sheriff's Department had. Not only do we have the ability to search on land with our SAR teams, in air with our Rescue 9 and our helicopters, now we have a pretty robust Air Force in the Sheriff's Department, and this has all happened since our new Sheriff's taken over. We got that Rescue 9 out there, and that, that the only one that's not as happy about the search and rescue helicopter, the Rescue 9, is our searchers, because they're not being used as much now because they go out there and find everybody and they bring them safely and get them back where they need to do. And they said, in a way it's good, and in a way it's bad, because we're not out here searching and doing all the things we have to do. But we also have the ability to go out and go into the water. Unfortunately, there's times we lose people, lose things that we have to go in water. Well, you and I, I don't know about you, I can't hold my breath that long, which you're probably looking at me and say, I'm pretty sure you could hold your breath pretty long. But no, but they could go out there and they are very professional. They, uh, we have a whole dive unit consists of people from all the stations, from one side of the county to the next. And we've, unfortunately, we've had to use them at times in some of um, the country clubs too. You know, where they go into, because a lot of country clubs have golf courses, people get lost. I know we had one real big one in Desert Springs Marriott that was lost for a while, so we do that. But the Sheriff's Department has these units, these, this dive unit that belongs to us, and we go out. <clears throat> one thing that's fairly new, and it's new, We've always had a posse. We've always had a volunteer posse on horseback, but now we have a mounted enforcement unit. Different units, posse is a whole bunch of volunteers that come out there, they're on horse, they take care of different events we have, they go out there, but we also have a mounted enforcement detail that our sworn deputy sheriffs, they're out on horseback. And they come out, and they could bring a lot of capabilities to us, you know, and crowd control and other things like that works out very good because, you know what, you get a big horse coming in, and you're sitting up about six feet higher than everybody else, people tend to listen a little more. And get to see them, there, there's a lot of a benefit to that. <clears throat> That's that uh, big helicopter, Rescue 9 and it's been doing wonders. Recently, we have just staffed uh, one on the east end of the county. For years and years, as long as I've been here, we've never staffed one in the east end of the county. So now, with our new sheriff for, well, he's not new, he's been four years, Chad Bianco made sure that he said, hey, I want air capabilities on both sides. So we have one in thermal, that has the ability to go anywhere in the east end real quick, and then we also staff one out of Hemet. <clears throat> now a bird like that, if for some reason, even before that, if they had to go to the east end, they could be at the east end in 30 minutes. They could fly from Hemet and be in, in thermal in less than 30 minutes. That's a, that's a big bird and very capable. <clears throat> Over here is another addition to our, um, our Sheriff's Department is our mobile command centers. We used to have, and I thought were pretty nice, we had the, the motorhomes. Uh, one thing I did have, you know, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. One of my assignments uh, was I was uh, on the emergency, uh, the Sheriff's emergency response team. And I would be on the unit that that is on the bottom slide there or the bottom of the, Photographs, we'd go out to any critical incident, major disasters. I did that for about nine years. And I would go to these big fires and everything, and we had that big motorhome. 
And when we saw these, I saw these guys, and son of a gun, they really came a long way since, heck, they waited till I left to get the good stuff out there. But these are amazing. These are amazing. They have computers in these. They have uh, terminals. They have everything you could think of needing, possibly needing at a critical incident. We're equipped, and we have these two that are very, very good. Another thing that every, and I'm telling you, every agency in Riverside County has access to our SWAT team. Most agencies, if you notice, um, if you look into any law enforcement agency out there, most of their SWAT teams are on call. We are one of the very few, I think we're the only one, in Riverside County to have an on-duty SWAT team 24-7. So these guys, that's all they do. They don't have, this is not an ancillary duty. Prior to, to our sheriff taking office, they were. It was an ancillary duty. They were patrol deputies. They got a page or a phone call and they left their job. They had to roll over to their SWAT headquarters, pick up their equipment, and then they would go. These guys, that's all they are. SWAT members, every day, that's all they do. Very. I, I think are one of the and one of the best trained in the world again, and I and you'll probably say, hey, that's a common theme with him. It, it's a common theme because I've been around a while and I've seen them and I've seen them operate and I know what's out there. Our guys are the best. They come out there, they're going to take care of the safest way and bring it to the most peaceful conclusion that there can be. Unfortunately, there are times where they have to use force and they have to neutralize somebody and take them out. And that happens, but they are going to do what they have to do, keeping the community as safe as they can. Back to you. And then we'll answer questions later, right? Thank you so much, Captain Salas. You can see why we wanted him out here, because he gives a great presentation and has a very big personality. Um, and I do absolutely agree with Captain Salas. We've seen tremendous growth over the last four years um, in this department, and it's a place that I can truly be proud of. I've been with the department for, uh, should I date myself? Uh, <laughs> for over 20 years, we'll leave it at that. And um, I've just seen the growth and the positive change, especially in the last four years. So to me, it's a blessing from God to be a part of this department. Um, and I believe Tim feels the same exact way. So I showed you the history of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department originally. That sheriff, that was a one-man job to cover all this area. He might deputize an individual or two, but it was a one-man job. And now you see where we're at today. The department is over 4,000 members strong. Um, I'm here to represent the Corrections Division. I will let you know that the Corrections Division is 1,500 members strong. Um, we have five different jail facilities, one out in the Blythe area, very small space, about three, I think they house about 300 plus inmates. Um, we have the Coise M. Bird Detention Center, that's out in Marietta. It used to be called the Southwest Station. Um, and then the name was changed to honor um, a former sheriff, Coisin Bird. And I forget exactly what their headcount there is, but I want to say it's about 1,100. We have our brand new John J. Benoit Detention Center, which replaced our old Indio Jail. Um, if you ever got the chance to see that one, uh, it was very small. Um, all the old types of bars that you would see on movies. It was a pretty neat place to, to uh, work at but it was extremely small, very outdated, and it was beginning to have significant issues since it was built in the 60s. Um, so now this is our new uh, John J. Benoit. It's only partially open. Right now I believe that there's four floors, um, and only one floor is open um, until we can get additional staffing, not only um, law enforcement staffing, but also all the support staffing that goes with it. At each one of our jail facilities, um, not only do we have um, correctional professionals working there, but we also have medical, mental health professionals, um, chaplains, education services. I mean, just about anything that you could think of that could support a community, because that's basically what these spaces are. Um, we have those individuals there. 
Here's the Robert Presley Detention Center. Um, a portion of this was taken down. It used to be connected to the uh, courthouse down there. You saw that photo with the, um, the posse in front of it. So a portion used to be connected to the um, courthouse there, but it was beginning to have significant issues too because it was extremely old. They took that part down. This part was left. It's seven stories high, um, and I believe their headcount is somewhere under 1,000. And that one, if I didn't say, is in downtown Riverside. And then I bring you to my favorite space, which is the Larry D. Smith Correctional Facility. That's kind of an overview of our facility. This space, um, actually the land was purchased back in the 20s, and it was an old industrial road camp. The Sheriff's Department itself didn't purchase it until around 1974, if, I believe, if I'm correct. It may have been 73, sometimes I get those two years confused. Um, and it was an old industrial road camp. We did a lot of weekenders and um, stuff like that out there. So imagine somebody had um, a DUI, and, but they still need to work full time, right? Um, and so they would come check in for the weekend, do what they had to do, and then go back out to the community. We've definitely grown from there. I worked there over 20 years ago. Um, and when I first got there, there were 10 people on a team. Um, and each one of us worked one small space. Our um, booking space, which is where you take in individuals who have been arrested, uh, if I bent over to try to pat somebody down, I would bump into the wall behind me. That's how small it was. Uh, so it was very, very tiny. Um, we have grown and expanded um, since then. At this point in time, um, we can um, accommodate about 1,500 people. Back in the day when it was a road camp, um, it was very focused on um, program bleh programmatic opportunities. So there were things like a pig farm, there was auto body shop and painting and different opportunities out there to employ individuals or teach them employment skills so that they could hopefully go back out to the community and use those skills in a positive way to change their life and be good contributing members of society. That has not changed at the Smith Correctional Facility. What we have done is um, changed some of the programs. But before I move on, I did want to point out the picture. The top right up there is what your typical housing area looks like. Each of those are two-man um, cells, um, for lack of a better word. And the open space is a day room where they have tables, chairs, TVs, phones. Um, they can hang out, uh, play games. They can do their homework. They can do all that kind of stuff. In each of the celled areas, they have their beds, they have um, a desk to be able to, to work at, write letters, do homework um, if they're enrolled in a program. Um, and then this bottom left-hand corner is kind of our control pod space. So that's where the deputies will sit, kind of supervise everybody, and then they have the computer systems to be able to open and close the doors and keep everything very secured. And then one of our fantastic deputies there. <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> So some of the programs and services that we provide, we do continue on with educational programs, which has been something that we've always done, um, but we've kind of enhanced them, and we work with um, College of the Desert and um, the Department of Education to um, provide education, GED services, all that type of stuff. We also provide reentry and transition needs, so you're talking about helping people plan to be released, and then what are they gonna do when they get out? so that they're not just being popped back into society with no plan in place. Okay, um, it, those are important things for people to have, to connect with family, to connect with friends, to, to fix some of the mistakes of their past and try to cure those things so that when they transition back outwards, they have a support system in place. We also introduce them to local agencies that partner with us, and it, my very last slide has a bunch of those agencies involved um, for different reporting centers where they can get medical mental health services, um, continued education services, continued career services. While they're with us, we help them get their driver's license again. They can vote if they're not a um, uh, convicted felon. So we allow them, or we assist them in voting, not that we tell them what to vote, because I know what I would, but uh, we give them the, the cards and let them, or figure out how to do it. Um, we, get, we have a career technical education, so I have a few slides that I'll be able to show you some of the career technical education that we give. Everything is certified, meaning that they're getting certifications, they're getting accreditation in different skills that we're able to provide. Um, 
let's see, substance abuse. Substance abuse is a big one. We have a lot of narcotics and alcoholics anonymous groups um, and volunteers that come in. If that's something that you've been engaged in in the past and you're interested in volunteer services, it's definitely something that we're always open to because we consistently need volunteers for that. A lot, if not, I would say most, if not all, of the individuals that we have in our custody have an underlying substance or alcohol abuse pro um, problem that ha has built on for them to go into criminal um, activities. Uh, criminal thinking and behaviors. So we have, um, I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of support staff as far as medical, mental health, educators, counselors, chaplains, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of those counselors are able to sit with each individual um, who, um, volunteers to be a part of the program. They have to want to do it, right? Um, but for those individuals who are interested, they'll sit and they'll break down criminal thinking and criminal behaviors. And why is it that you chose this? Why did you do this? What's a different decision that you could have made, right? Um, they also, um, we also provide parenting classes and anger management classes. Um, a lot of these individuals have children. And if we're going to change society, we have to start there. So we try to help them to understand their children a little bit better, to um, get anger management techniques so that um, they're not going home and um, furthering that revolving door. Um, we also uh, have specialized, need, specialized um, care for our incarcerated veterans. Unfortunately, sometimes our veterans um, either engage in criminal behavior just for whatever purpose, or they're suffering from PTSD and something happens and they become incarcerated. So we do a lot of support and um, counseling for our veteran community. I already talked about adult um, education. Uh, we do have a lot of religious and volunteer services. Uh, let me skip on to the next one. That way we get into it. So. Um, our goal here is to reduce recidivism. And just in case you can't see it, recidivism refers to a person's relapse into criminal behavior. That's really the goal. Um, so we're not just working on the outside with our communities and supporting our fantastic communities, right? We're trying to support our communities from the inside too because every individual that comes to us eventually goes back into the community. And like I said, we want them to be positively contributing members of society. So getting into why they're doing the things that they're doing and helping to support them out of those things is very, very important. And that's where we talk about reducing recidivism. A lot of the um, classes and different programs that we provide are all evidence-based programs. So there's evidence that shows that these programs work. And there's actually even testing that we do, um, and I can't remember the name of the testing um, off the top of my head, but it'll actually, um, same as like when you were in high school and maybe you took a test and it told you what your personality was bet best fit for for a job, which mine, by the way, said law enforcement, and I thought, oh, that's funny. I'm not going into law enforcement, I'm gonna be a doctor. Uh, there was no one to pay for my college education, so here I am, and I am very fortunate to be here. Um, but that test told me what fit my personality. These same tests do the same things for these individuals. They kind of show some underlying traits that bring them into this lifestyle and help to break those uh, habits that they're in so that they can change their lifestyle. Is it 100% effective? No, you have to want to change first, right? But we do our best to hand them the skills and, ev and the support that they need to change. We have what's known as the RESET program, which is the reentry services enhancing transition. transition. So um, earlier I was talking about um, giving them all the support that they need to be able to transition back out into the community. You hear oftentimes about people who have been in prison for years and then they come back out and they've got like a bus voucher and 200 bucks for a hotel and nothing else, right? We want to prevent that from happening. So a lot of the time, we're working well in advance to help them have all the support that they need to get back out into the community. And that includes um, getting back in touch with their family and their children. So one of the programs that we have is the um, ABC's Reading Project. That's a project where the incarcerated individual gets to record in their own voice them reading a story to their child 10 years or younger. And they write a letter um, and 
the counselor includes their name and phone number for the family to be able to contact. And we set all that up so that they can build those relationships with their children, with their spouses, with their families again, right? I mean, how precious is that? I know um, when my children were younger, I have three of them, and um, one of them, um, we uh, somebody gifted me this teddy bear that makes the sound of the womb, and it was my own heartbeat and my own womb sounds for my baby to have in the crib with them, right? Um, and then another one, I got a gift from somebody where I was able to read my child a story. And then my daughter, my youngest, is 12 now, and she still has that book with my voice way back then reading her a story. So that's pretty special. Um, and, and it obviously connects with the family. Education, um, as I mentioned, we do provide a lot of education. It's not just, you know, here's you a booklet and work on that all by yourself. We actually get them on computers. We teach them computer skills. Um, we, like I said before, they can get um, their driver's license. They can renew things. They can do taxes. They can do all kinds of things over here. And we help them with it um, in every way possible so that they have those skills to get back out into society. Um, we also have a lot of career education or career technical programs, all hands-on training with um, actual educators and professionals in the field. So some of those, or I'm sorry, let me start with some of the booklets. Here's more of the education space, and then some of the booklets, you'll see that one's um, self-worth, and the other one's getting started. Those are just a couple samples of the booklets that they're provided, but if you look in the background, you can see all the booklets on the tables. There's a lot of different things that we provide. Like I said, anger management and parenting and uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, just a variety. Again, here's our VETS program. So just supporting our VETS um, through cognitive-based therapeutic curriculum, lifestyle balance, mental health support, which is one of the things that we really need for a lot of these individuals. You know what drugs do to the body and what drugs do to the brain, right? And then we have PTSD on top of that. Mental health services and mental health support are extremely important and um, have probably been undervalued in this country for a long time, but it's all coming to a head and we're all seeing how important those things are and seeing a lot of um, support now to get that out there for the community and those incarcerated. Our vets have their own classroom where they um, get together, they do the Pledge of Allegiance, they um, share their stories about their um, service and what things brought them to where they're at and they work with other veterans so we have um, law enforcement um, deputies at the facility that are prior veterans and we also have veteran counselors um, etc uh, who come in to support them people that can speak from that same experience that they've had we also have a currently award-winning culinary arts program uh, which doesn't sound exciting, but we actually have um, a couple of pro chefs, and we partner with, um, oh, I think it's College of the Desert. It is partnership with College of the Desert. So we have a couple of pro chefs that come in, and they're actually teaching them all the skills that you would need to be a chef yourself. Um, and the wonderful thing is, is especially one of our chefs is so well known in the community that he's actually been able to um, partner with a couple of restaurants, give... Um, his support for a person to go in and have a job there, already waiting for them. So that's really our biggest goal, is to partner with the community for jobs in place. Because it's great to have all kinds of skills, right? But it's not great when you go and the doors are all closed. So by um, it's something that we're continuing to partnership with various areas. We've reached out to Amazon, we've reached out to the Skechers Warehouse, um, because we provide the, that type of training too, those warehouse services training, forklift, op, uh, forklift operation, heavy machine operation, um, so that they have those skills, accreditation, certification, to be able to go out there and get a job. We haven't been successful with everybody yet, but, uh, you know, the greasy, or the, what is it? Will? What's the will? Where there's a will, there's a way. And the uh, loudest, whatever, the squeaky wheel. Squeaky wheel gets the most grease. So we keep on being a squeaky wheel. We also have a barista program. 
Um, you may have seen this on Facebook or Instagram. It's pretty exciting. And I will tell you what they make over there is amazing. And the difference in the individuals working over there, I've been able to see that part um, myself um, firsthand. I'm amazed by the, the, right now we have um, a group of ladies that work inside of our barista program. Um, and they are excited every day. When I go in there, I try to go in as frequently as possible um, just so that they know that I fully support what they're doing. And um, generally, we all go by last names, our last names, uh, and we call um, all the incarcerated individuals by their last names. But I've tried to make it a point to go in there and get to know the girls by their first name. And whenever I come in, they're like, oh, Captain, Captain Vernal, how are you today? And, um, so I always spend a little bit of time over there talking with them and seeing how things are going for them. And it has been beautiful to see the change in their personality, their outlook, what their dreams are, what their hopes are for the future, and that they actually do have hope. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, so we have a barista program. Um, let's see, knowledge and skills are taught under the supervision of barista trained certified staff through the Specialty Coffee Association. Um, in addition, they've been able to, they get their food handler's card and all that type of stuff, but in addition, they've had uh, coffee tasting sessions with Riverside County Coffee Roasters, um, the coffee shop in Temecula some, is one of our vendors, as well as the Cappuccino in Corona. So we are definitely reaching out to the community for um, more support and to continue to push our footprint out there. One of the big programs that the sheriff's excited about, and we don't have it off the ground yet, but you may see soon in the future, food trucks. Um, food truck vending, food truck, all the type of food, handling a business. And the individuals in our barista program, as well as our future food truck program, they don't just make food and that's all they learn how to do. No, they learn how to order, they learn how to balance the books, they learn how to customer service, right? They learn everything that they need from the bottom to the top to be able to run a business if they so choose to in the future. So it's pretty exciting. And while I'm, um, let me move to the next photo. This is another portion of the um, barista program. And while I'm on here, you'll see that everything up there are, are wood signs. Everything here was made by our woodworking technology. Uh, so they, the um, inmates themselves made these things. Um, and it's something that they're pretty proud of because it, it's amazing work. I'll continue to show you some more. So we also do um, landscaping, vocational skills, all that type of stuff. So they learn concrete work, uh, masonry, um, plumbing, piping, all that type of stuff. Um, and I've got additional pictures to show you of all that. And I, I don't want to sit here and read through everything, but um, construction technology, that program incorp incorporates curriculum from the National Center for Construction, Education, and Research. Um, and then, uh, let's see. They're delivered in partnership with Riverside County Office of Education and Desert Edge School. So, and then on top of it, everybody receives their Occupational Safety and Health Administration training and cert certification. We have welding services. That's something that we just started a few years ago. Um, back about four or five years ago, there was a shortage of about 50,000 welders across the United States. Um, and so we started a welding program. And with COVID, um, you know, we had to back off a little bit. We got a virtual welder for them to practice with. So now they start on the virtual welding machine, learn the mechanics of welding, and then they can move on to actual welding. And they've made some pretty amazing things over there. This is actually one of the individuals in the program, um, as well as another individual behind him, welding. Wagon wheels uh, and all kinds of cool stuff that they make, right? In fact, um, our woodworking and welding um, vocational has actually partnered with um, Friends of the Valley, and I'll have a picture in a little bit, to create some items for them for their auction, a uh, charity auction that's coming up. And so that's another part that they're very excited about. So not only are they learning skills, but they're also learning that feeling of service to the community and giving back. There's no greater feeling than that, right? I mean, honestly, that's what I thrive on is if anytime I can make a positive change in my community or in one person's life, I feel like I've absolutely succeeded that day, right? And now we're teaching them that they can do the exact same thing and feel that success and feel that joy to serve others. Here's more of the woodworking machine. So they're all on state-of-the-art machinery. We're not talking about old-fashioned, you know, I've got a saw and a hammer and, <laughs> and my club, 
Um, they've all got state-of-the-art machinery to work on, and they learn how to use it. Um, here's some working on some stuff. This is our large area. You can see that they've got edge banding, um, assembly, and I can't even read the other one because I don't have glasses. Um, I can't read it. But they work hand in hand with our correctional deputies. And it's great for our deputies as well because here they are teaching somebody a skill and changing lives, which makes you, um, I would say it just makes you feel so much more invested, right? You're not just there supervising an individual, you're there investing in their future and the future of their children and the huge ripple effect that that has in the community. I don't think that there's anything that's more satisfying. Here you can see that they're working programming the machinery, all that type of stuff. So, I mean, like I said, they learn everything from bottom up and up down. Here's some work that they've done. They did the wood slats on the wall. They also made the American flag and all the tabletops and chairs. That's all things that they made. And that's for their veterans program, but they made that for the veterans program. They also make some of our um, in-house awards new things that we've got coming up and, and we're working on are not only laser engraving, because now they're able to laser en engrave cups. I couldn't find any um, good pictures of that. But um, they're working on t-shirt graphics and design as well. So just all kinds of things that are out there for, for these individuals to learn whatever they're most interested in. I was talking about some of the woodworking that they did. This is what the wagon wheels are for. They've been out there making benches and, and all kinds of cool things. But then all the landscaping, that's all them as well. That's them drawing up plans, them designing, them putting in the, um, the um, thank you very much, irrigation, and, <laughs> and, um, and then putting out the plants and all that type of stuff under on a budget. They have a budget to work in. So it's w looking at all aspects of it. If I own my business and I was out there doing this and designing this, how do I do it? Here's one of the things that um, Friends of the Valley has asked them to make. So they're making a few dog beds um, to be able to, to have auctioned for charity. And an additional example of the design and landscaping that they've done. So that's all them planning it, working it out, and it's beautiful work. I'm extremely impressed with it. It's amazing. Um, I was talking to with an individual earlier who was out at the facility, um, you know, 20 to 30 years ago. And you, if you ever saw it before and you see it now, it's amazing what the difference is. And this is just their hard work and effort. We also have what's called the Gray Bar Print Shop, which is a professional printing service. We um, print um, booklets and flyers and all types of things for the community as well as all the local law enforcement agencies in the county. Um, and it's pretty well sought after um, what they're able to do there. But they're learning graphic design. Um, they're using graphic design software, digital operating systems, print production, um, and they're known for the high quality printing, um, not only to our department but to outlying agencies. So you can see here, um, I included this picture just to show the outside of Graybar printing, but also the fact that all of these work together. So we have these guys that are learning graphic design, right? And we have woodworking and metalworking and landscaping and everything and how it works together to create a beautiful um, setting. Working on the computer, looking up graphic designs. So they work on the whole design, layout, cutting, everything. And here they are uh, making some targets for us. <laughs> yeah, did you get to see it? Target sitting right up there for us. So, Yeah, and you can see the big one in the back too. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> We're grateful for them. So they do black and white digital printing over here. And then we also have... Um, Color pr full color printing digital services. And like I said, this same group, that's where they're gonna be learning um, graphic design for t-shirts and other items. And then let me get back into my sales plug. 
So earlier I was talking about Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, but we also um, take religious volunteers. And really, to me, this is one of the most important jobs in the world. I believe personally that if you have God, you have everything. Um, and if you want to change your life, that's a great way to start. So we do have a, uh, not that I'm trying to force anybody, but I'm just saying those are my beliefs. Um, but we do take in a lot of religious volunteers um, that cover a wide variety of different religions. Um, whatever it is that they're interested in, um, we provide secular and non-secular um, education for them. And I just can't speak to the importance of it enough. I think it's very important. I know for me, myself, um, we've had these uh, chaplains and, and religious volunteers come in for our inmates for a very, very long time, and I've seen the difference it's made in a few people's lives. I've had people come to me and tell me the difference in their life. I will say, um, as my own personal testimony, um, that as the commander at the facility, I was able to get a chaplain for the staff there, and I've seen the amazing difference it's made for my staff. Um, so if it makes such a big difference for people who are already positively contributing to society, we can only imagine what kind of difference it's making for individuals who might feel slightly hopeless, who have made some big mistakes, and who need some changing, right? Um, but I know that for my staff alone, uh, they've come to me and told me that um, they're just incredibly grateful to have somebody support them, support their beliefs, and, um, and now they're having conversations with one another that they didn't used to have. They're meeting peers that they didn't know had the same belief system as they had. And now they're having those conversations, and a lot of my younger staff are actually turning to God. So it's pretty neat. I know this isn't a religious service, but I just wanted to share with you that we do that for our inmates, but I've also employed that for our staff because I think it's incredibly important. And then this last slide just shows you some of the um, partnerships and collaboration that we're involved in. We've got um, Riverside Unify or University Health Systems, their behavioral health. Um, housing Authority, the Workforce, uh, Probation, District Attorneys, Public Defender, just a myriad. And this doesn't even actually cover it. I would have had to have put probably another 20 emblems on here to cover all the different organizations that support us and help provide um, transition for these individuals. I hope that that wasn't boring and I hope that you were interested. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. I am open to answering any questions as is Captain Salas. Remember, don't forget, you must use the microphone, so raise your hand and let me know. First of all, where is that prison? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, we're loaded, located right on Hargrave Street here in Banning, or down the road in Banning. Okay, when you two guys are partners, how, does that, how is that represented? Oh, wonderful, I we mean, support one another. Tim covers the um, unincorporated areas out here and I'm his support at the jail system, and vice versa. And we okay, just try my, to, to... My biggest question ahead. is why aren't these things offered in public schools? Oh, goodness. Believe me, I have my opinions about public schools, and I think if we went back to giving kids occupational training and vocational training and support and religious service from the very beginning, our country wouldn't be in the place it is right now. But I don't think you're here for my personal opinion. So, <laughs> but if you want it, I'll keep on giving it. <laughs> two, two questions, please. Can you explain the difference between jails and prisons? When does somebody go to the jail and not prison? Is there a minimum, maximum for the jail? What is the role of each and your role? And the second question is, when a prisoner leaves your facility and they're not picked up by somebody, what is done with that person? Are they taken to a certain spot and dropped off? How is that handled? Thank you. Both are great questions. So the difference between a prison and a jail, a prison is um, a place where somebody who has been convicted of a felony crime is going to go serve an, a, a sentence. And that sentence could be anywhere from one year to life in prison. It just depends on the type of crime. Uh, AB 109, um, changed, and you can look up what AB 109 is, it changed um, the qualifications for individuals going to prison versus jail. Jails were always meant to be short term. We weren't meant to ever be long term holding facilities. So what happens is Tim's team will arrest a bad guy. He's burglarizing the local Walmart, right? And he'll come to jail. At the jail, we process them and they stay there until their arraignment. At arraignment, 
they're either released on their own recognizance, which means that a judge believes that they'll come back to court when they're supposed to, or, um, or they're held and they'll come back to the jail. At the jail, they can be bailed out. Um, we can, um, depending on their needs, there's different services that will we'll, um, take them on. But generally, once they're back at the jail, then they're ours. And they're our responsibility to take back and forth to court until they're either convicted or released, right? Found not guilty. If they're convicted, then it depends on what they were convicted for. If they were convicted for a misdemeanor act, which generally, by the way, we don't really hold misdemeanors, um, but if they were convicted for a misdemeanor act, then they can serve their time in jail. If they're convicted for a felony act, that's where it gets tricky because of AB 109. So AB 109 said that anything that's considered um, nonviolent, um, I can't remember what the other non-non-nons were, but basically violent, nonviolent acts, uh, those could be held in the jail system. But what they consider nonviolent is weird sometimes. So the longest sentence that I've had um, in the jail system is about 13 years, and that was for child um, torture. And that was considered a nonviolent act by the state of California. And so instead of that individual going, my heart says the same thing, but instead of that individual going to a state prison, they serve time with us, and they'll stay with us for that entire time. That is not what jails were originally designed for, but that's what we've had to morph into. Um, Prisons are designed for people that are convicted of felony offenses, and that's where they're supposed to go. We've become, I don't want to say that we're a pseudo prison, but we've become more like it now that we have to hold those types of individuals for long term. The difference between the prisons too, though, is that there's a lot more leniency at the prison. There they can have um, their own radio, their own television. Um, there's a lot of things that they can do there. In some prisons, uh, depending, like if you have, um, like, look up at Atascadero, so places where sexually violent predators who can't be released out to the public, um, those areas have uh, like a McDonald's and a mall and stuff like that, which to me is, in, is crazy, right? But uh, we don't have anything like that. We don't do that type of thing. I hope that kind of answers that question. And then to question two, what happens when an individual is released from our facility um, because we are in the midst of a residential neighborhood. So what happens to that individual when they're released, but they don't have a ride out of the facility? We are um, very diligent partners with our community, with Chief Hamner and Chief Talese, and um, we do not just let people walk away from the facility. So there's a couple of things that we can do. If they don't have a ride from the facility, a family member who checks in at the front with an ID and says that I'm here to pick up Alyssa Vernal, um, which I hope that never happens, but uh, <laughs> unless it's my husband taking me to lunch, I don't want anybody checking in the front with my name, right? But um, I'm here to pick up Alyssa Vernal, here's my ID, then we process the individual and walk them right out to the car, right? But say that they don't have a ride. Anybody who lives east of this area, not in Banning and not in Beaumont, anybody who lives east, goes um, out to the John Benoit Detention Center and they're dropped there with a bus pass because there is a bus pass there and there's a criminal center there, so that's where they're dropped off at. Anyone who lives, um, I'm sorry? The John Benoit Detention Center, so that basically Indio Jail. Um, anybody who lives west of this area, again, not Banning and Beaumont, is taken to the Robert Presley Detention Center in Riverside and they're given a bus pass there, right? And it could be the Greyhound or it could just be the traditional uh, bus pass, depending on what they need and where they're going. Anybody who lives the other way, <laughs> I'm not good with my directions. Uh, well, the, yeah, west, we're thinking like Hemet, Paris, all that type of stuff. No, that's south. South, thank you very much. I, I need that correction because you can see it's not in my head. I rely on my GPS heavily. Anybody who lives south is taken out to the um, Coist Bird Detention Center. From there, they're also in a residential community. The other two are not. Coist Bird is in a residential community. So for, if we have to take them out there, they're actually given a taxi voucher, a taxi um, that contracts with the county is called out, they pick them up and take them to their home location closest out there. 
that service is actually coming into play through um, the Board of Supervisors at all of the jails so that we no longer have to transport them all over the county. Instead, they can have their taxi voucher and be taken straight to the place where they call home or where they have somebody to, to take them in. Um, now, there's the banning and Beaumont residents. I want to fully answer this question for you. Banning and Beaumont residents are dropped off here in the community because they're verified banning and Beaumont residents. So we have the Highland Springs drop off. That bus stop is one place where they can be dropped off and that's only during daytime hours. Nighttime hours, we don't want to be dropping them off there, so we take them over to the Bannock Civic Center. I am working with Chief Talese and Chief Hamner to find alternate locations. I don't like the Highland Springs drop-off. Uh, I just don't, I don't like that we're dropping people off there. I think there are better places, but that's a conversation that Chief Talese and Chief Hamner are having with me so that we can find better locations for them to be dropped off where there might be a little bit more support um, versus a shopping center. Does that cover that? Um, I was wondering, do you have many escapes? And if you do, would our community be at risk? Great question, and I'm glad that you asked it, because I would love to uh, make you guys all feel secure. No, we do not have very many escapes. Um, there are two I can think of off the top of my head. No, I'm sorry, three that I can think of off the top of my head over the last 25 years. Um, one individual was able to climb under a delivery truck. Um, they were working in kitchen services and they were able to climb under a delivery truck and hang on tight for dear life like you see in like the speed movies, uh, which is insane, right? And they made it all the way out to the exit um, to the Indio jail, I think that's Jefferson, and then rolled out from under the vehicle. Thankfully did not kill themselves or get hit by a vehicle. Uh, but another motorist saw them, called it in, and we had them immediately. That's the um, only one that I've known of that has made it off-site. Um, we had a female one time who was able to um, make it out of a small space, which we've secured now, um, and she was on the grounds and couldn't find a way out of the grounds because the grounds are very heavily secured. We have um, concrete walls, we have cameras, we have all kinds of things that, um, and we ended up actually bringing in a bloodhound just to search her out, and she was in a little cubby hole in, a, in an old building that we had. So she did not make it off the grounds. Um, are you guys safe? Yes. Uh, we also have, for those who live close by us, if you ever see up on top of our um, concrete walls, the red lights going, which in all my years, I've seen it uh, twice, once for a fire and once for the individual who was able to crawl out that I was just talking about. You, those red lights will signify that somebody's out on the grounds um, or that we're looking for somebody. Maybe they haven't made it off the grounds. Um, but each time that we, w I took over the correctional facility about six months ago. So my very first order of business was to get my lieutenants with me and to go through and do a site survey. So we brought in some professionals as well to site survey for security. I wanted to be sure that there was no place that somebody could hide, that somebody could find a way out. We think about Alcatraz and all those old jails and vent systems and things like that. I don't have those systems in my jail the way that it's built, but I still want to look at it and make sure that we have all security measures in place. So we have, um, we did identify a couple areas where I could use an, um, some additional cameras. So we're working with the Board of Supervisors to get some additional cameras and some spaces that I would like to have cameras on that I think would help um, just make it a little bit more secure for our grounds. Um, but as far as any major security breach type of areas, I haven't been able to locate one. Um, and then to go back to the individual that I told you that made it out underneath the vehicle, um, what we do now is any vehicle coming in and out, we've always had them open their doors and we've looked inside the vehicle to be sure nobody could be hiding in there, but now we take mirrors and everything and go underneath the vehicles just to be sure because um, goodness sakes, I don't wanna see that happen again. So I have a question. I was listening to your partner's sale of having the sheriff as the police or the officers in the city, and I lived in a city like that once. But here we have two different law enforcement people. We've got county, the sheriffs and we've got PD, Banning PD. And it sounds like you partner a bit with them, but how else do you partner with them? As everybody knows, we have a huge homeless problem. So how do you, or do you, partner with the city of Banning? Yes, we do. We partner with the city of Banning um, a whole lot. 
uh, Banning, uh, Matthew Hamner, the chief of police, and their captain is Jeff Horn. I talk to them on a regular basis. I talk to them on a regular basis because we are such a large agency. Uh, what we do is they come to us for a lot of assistance because all the things that I showed you that we have, our sheriff is very generous with every, because he's a head law enforcement official for the whole county. He makes him, all our resources available to any agency within Riverside County. All they have to do is formally request it. So uh, we, we do it all the time. And uh, you know, the question going back to when they asked that, how do her and I partner together? <clears throat> Alyssa and I are commanders, and there's, I believe there's, what, 30 commanders in the, with corrections, how many corrections commanders do you have? Five, okay, so there's like 27 captains, commanders within the sheriff's department. We have 22 uh, patrol commanders that run commands, patrol stations, special units, that's what they do, and then you have the ones in the corrections that run the correctional, or the, then we have some that run the courts, and. We, we are all captains, and we all are one team trying to accomplish the same thing. So that's how we're, we're partnered. We're, we're partners, and Alyssa and I work in the same area, so as soon as she got here, we, we met up, and we said, hey, you know what? We're trying to accomplish the same thing. Anything you need from me, anything I need from you, and I love working with her. She is a great partner, and um, so we, we, we have... There's probably about 27 captains in the, in the uh, Riverside County Sheriff's Department, and we're all team. We're all one team trying to accomplish the same thing. I, I wanted to add on a little bit about the homeless question on and how we help um, with that. So part of the way that um, the correctional facility assists in that is um, when they come in and they're identified as homeless, we try to identify immediately. We also identify what agency arrested them. Um, I won't go too deep into that part, but we, when they're released, um, I'm sure that you guys have heard of Governor Newsom's new care court and some other things. There's resources for the homeless. So we do try to partner with our behavioral health services who have um, opportunities for housing and stuff like that for individuals who are interested and who qualify, especially those with mental health needs. Um, oftentimes we can have, and I meant to say this when we were talking about releases as well, um, but oftentimes we can partner with um, an organization to come and pick the individual up and take them to housing. Um, as far as the homeless themselves go, those who uh, either don't have identified severe mental health um, concerns or they're not interested in, in receiving any assistance, we look at it and we make sure that they were actually a Banning or Beaumont resident in the area identified by Banning or Beaumont PD to be sure that we're not releasing a transient from a different area oh. back into this community. Oh. We've all heard of, I, li I personally currently live in Riverside, um, and when Orange County did a big sweep, the um, river trail, I used to take my kids down the river trail and we used to ride bikes and all that type of stuff, and when they did a big sweep, we could no longer go down that river trail. There were things that um, were not appropriate for them to see or hear or be around, needles laying out, all that type of stuff. So I absolutely understand the concerns of the community. I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, and I'm a community member. And so it's always very important to me that whatever we do in the community, that we're doing, uh, having as much positive impact as possible. So that's also part of what um, Chief Talese and Hammer ha and I have talked about, is making sure that one, these individuals actually are from the Banning Beaumont area, and two, where are we placing them? Okay, and sorry for not, thank you, uh, Alyssa, for picking up on that uh, homeless. Let me tell you one thing about homeless. Homeless is a big, big part of our, our problems in, in our area. So my guys in the city, in the county, everywhere we deal with homeless. We deal with homeless. Let me tell you one thing about homeless that people, a lot of people don't understand. Anybody who's homeless out there is because they want to be homeless. Our legislators are, unfortunately, 
we create a problem that we are probably not going to get out of in a long time because what we've done is a lot of people have a misunderstanding about homelessness. A lot of people believe, because I hear all the time, well, it's not, a, it's not against the law to be poor. I'm sorry, they're not poor. Every homeless person in Riverside County has been offered shelter. I know that for a fact. Every person, homeless person in Riverside County has been offered shelter. We offer it to them on a regular basis. The unfortunate thing is if they don't take it, we can't force them to take it. And we can't, we will not enforce any laws on them or trespassing laws or stuff until we offer it to them first. But what happens is that we have different programs throughout Riverside County that will house them in hotel rooms. I don't know about you, but every time I go to a hotel room, it costs me about $200 a night. They go, and they get it free. There's only one condition. They Well, there's more than one condition, but there's conditions. One of the conditions is they have to be tested. So they say, okay, well, if you're gonna, we're going to put you up. We're going to give you a job. We're going to give you food, and we're going to give you shelter. All you got to do is stop using drugs. So we'll come in. We'll test you every week so you don't do that. And then, hey, you get free shelter. Guess what? A lot of times we'll put them in and then they'll leave but because they don't want to do that. So <clears throat> I know a lot of people want to help people. I believe, too, in, in helping people any time we can. However, when we help the homeless, when we stop and give them money and we give them food and stuff like that, you're not helping them. You're just enabling them. So... Uh, Every law enforcement agency in Riverside County and probably the world is dealing with the same situation. But until people really understand that they're not just poor, they choose to live a lawless life. That's what they want to do. And unfortunately, a lot of them are victimizing all of us every single day. We could buy them shelter, we could do this and that, and all we're doing is giving them a place to commit their crimes. And that's my feeling on it, and this is videotaped too. <laughs> hey, you know what? The truth is the truth. I'm sorry, the truth is the truth, but that's it. So I just wanted everybody to understand that it is not us understanding, not understanding the true situation. We understand the true situation. We train all our personnel, but we have to operate within the parameters of the law. So the laws are the laws. Those are the laws of the land, so we follow them. I make sure every one of my personnel that is out dealing with, with um, our um, homeless are very well versed in it. They get trained, and they understand what they have to do, and that's what they do. It's hard for all of us. Yes. As hard as it is for you to understand and to see it, and think that we're just tolerating it, we have to operate within the, within the parameters of the law. Huh? Oh yes, yeah, what we do is we have specialized units that one of them is called the hot team and they're the ones that train my personnel and that's a homeless outreach team. And their job is just to deal with homeless. They have all the connections, they have every shelter, every resource, and, and I'm telling you, I'm a retired Army veteran myself, okay? And if anybody tells you that they're a homeless veteran, there's no reason to be a homeless veteran. You could go down, I've been in, not that I was homeless, but I've been to uh, March Air Force Base when I have been, when I was a sergeant, when they were first opening up their homeless shelter over there, any homeless veteran could go over there to March Air Force Base, receive a private room, and that is a lot nicer than anything that I got when I was in the service, and get fed three times a day, again, conditions come with it. They have to take the job that they give them, and they have to be tested. First of all, I want to say thank you for both of you, all, everybody in your team. 
everybody in the administration, to the, all the people that are out there, from there, the water, wherever you guys go, thank you so much. On behalf of all our personnel, I accept that thing. I had noticed that the pictures you were showing for the people, mostly men that have training, so this is two questions, are there training for women too so that they can go back home and get their children, you know, things like that? And um, I forgot what the other one was because I'm so fixed up, aided on the mothers that are there. Oh, yes, the second one is, is are there help out there for women that are at this particular place right here? Because I know there's usually separation, men and women, that type of thing. And also, are there mentor programs for children that are in high school, that are in communities that desperately need help because of there being gangs in the area more than anything else? Is there an internship program for those high schoolers to start looking at what you're doing? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Does that answer that? No. Um, the Gray Bar Print Shop, that actually was run by female inmates for a very long time, for the last couple of years. Um, several, I would say a couple hundred, cycled through that program. Uh, now we've transitioned them currently over to the barista program, while some of the guys learn the Gray Bar Print Shop. But the plan is to rotate them through all those different opportunities, because each person's interested in different things, right? Uh, one of my daughters, she thinks welding is pretty darn cool. Um, so, you know, if that's what she wants to do and she wants to call her, her, her price at 300 an hour with a minimum of three hours, I'm good with that. And she can weld me some gates. Uh, but, uh, no, it just, it depends. Um, if we have enough population interested in a particular uh, vocational skill set that we're able to provide, the training that we're able to provide, then yes, we'll get them rotated through. But right now we're definitely, um, ro we've rotated the males um, into gray bar and the females into barista program. So that was one question. Um, motherhood. Motherhood is one of the most important jobs in the world. I do not want to say that fatherhood is not important, though. Um, I will tell the dads out here, you're more important than you could ever know. I've seen what happens when people don't have dads in their lives. And even now, you can go back and fix it if you need to. Uh, my own dad walked out when I was like 12, and I had to start working to help support the family. It's one of the hardest things in the world. And you see the damage that it does to these ladies. But motherhood, is that uh, extremely important? Absolutely. There are different programs where the children are able to come in and bond with their mother again. Um, the ABCs program, that one is a big one for both males and females. Um, there's a few different things that go on with that. Um, I don't have all the details on the motherhood programs. I know that they want to grow that further because of how important it really is. Um, but we also have to look at the parameters of safety and um, what the individual is in for. If they were in for traumatizing the child, like the individual that I was referring to earlier, that's probably not somebody who's going to be qualified to enter a mothering program with us um, because we don't want to put that child in any physical or mental um, emotional harm. So we do have to be very careful. Um, now, are there mentorship programs for teens? In any area, good areas and bad areas, because our sheriff's department um, stations cover both good areas and bad areas and all the in-between, are there mentorship programs for those individuals to um, get interested in law enforcement? Absolutely. That's called our Explorer program. It is extremely exciting. I've had a number of people that um, have ended up working for me and then leaving me and working for Tim that went through the Explorer program as, um, you know, young teens. I believe that program starts at 14 or 15. 14 years old. So 14 years old. If you're interested, you can contact the lo local sheriff station. I, um, I believe the PD can talk a little bit more about their type of programs because they also have Explorer programs, um, if I'm correct. Um, but for the sheriff's department, we have Explorer programs as well. It starts at 14 years old, and it is phenomenal. Not that I'm representing, but I'm looking right at it where she's showing the partnership uh, over here at the very far side is Riverside County Office of Ed Education. One of the things that I did for 14 years, I also taught high school for uh, Riverside uh, Office of Education. I taught a law enforcement class at Valley View High School. And 
a lot of you probably don't, you know, when you ask a question like that, what we have available, this county has so much available. Right now, we have trade schools for every single subject you could think about ran by the county. You know, uh, my wife was uh, just recently retired, and she taught the medical programs with Riverside County Office of Education. This is the same program she would certify students as medical assistants. This is the same program that if you went to Bryman, Everest, any of one of those private schools, you'd pay $40,000 for it. Riverside County Office of Education makes that available to high school students free. And the difference is, if you work for Riverside County Office of Education, I know, I had to go to college to get a teaching credential, you have to be credentialed. Those private schools don't, you don't have to be credentialed. When they go to work, when they go to a program at any one of the high schools, I taught out of Valley View, you have to be a credentialed teacher. I taught law enforcement for 14 years. I did it from 2004 to 2018, right before I got promoted to captain. I said, I'm too busy, I can't teach at high school no more. I was teaching the seventh period, so I stopped doing that. But, so those programs are out there. There's a lot out there for all our youth, a lot out there for all our homeless. The thing is, is we can force people to get into these programs, but there is so much out there. We're, we're blessed to live in this county, to live in the United States. We really are, because there's so much out there. People just need to go out and take advantage of it. I would like to thank Captain Bernal and Captain Salas for an awesome presentation. Again, I would like, <laughs> I know. Thank you all so much for your time and um, just for being here today and allowing us to be here and to share with you. Um, I pray God blesses you all and if there's ever anything that you need, Captain Salas and I are, are here at your beck and call for sure. Thank you, Cap Ca Captains. So I am now going to bring up, I don't want anybody leaving yet, I still have Banning PD and we've got our own Securitas coming in and yes, you may ask them questions. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? My name is Mike. I'm your director of security here at Salt Lake. This is Lieutenant Roman, for those of you who haven't met us. I'm sure you've heard us over the phone when you guys call us and need assistance for anything that's you know, related to security. Uh, we're always here to assist you in any way, shape, or form as possible. I'm just going to touch up, touch up on a few things um, that you guys need to be aware about as far as what's going on in the community. Uh, like Michelle said, I will be open for questions and concerns. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I know a lot of you have this on top of your heads. Um, we do have somewhat of a speeding issue going on here inside of Sun Lakes. <laughs> so, with that being said, it is very important that we do comply with rules and regulations inside the community. Uh, we're not PD officers, but we will do our best into educating everybody that comes to our, get, our gates. Uh, personally, what we've done so far is every pass that we issue, is we highlight every pass that has a little memo on there. Please comply with our speed regulations, 25, 20 miles an hour at the most. Um, and we have actually followed some uh, guests, residents, and even staff that works here at Sun Lakes to inform them to comply with the speeding regulations. Uh, it is becoming a serious concern, uh, more because we've had incidents where we've had either somebody get hit by a vehicle or we've had little minor fender benders at our gates or inside the community. We can prevent that by educating. So let your guests know that come through, including yourselves or if you have neighbors or anybody that you see speeding through the community, let us know. We'll try our best to educate them and reach out to them and let them know how to comply with those rules and regulations. Um, we don't want to see somebody get struck with either incoming or outgoing traffic. So what I encourage also, of pedestrians that are walking through our gates, use the pedestrian gates, folks. Do not go through where the vehicles are coming in or the vehicles are exiting and out. Um, you can easily get struck by a car that way. It is something that you want to avoid. Use the pedestrian gates. Have your pedestrian keys with you. Um, definitely don't want to see your guests or any of you guys get hurt. So definitely practice coming through the pedestrian gates at all times. Uh, always observe any suspicious activity that happens through the community, call us, let us know that uh, there's somebody speeding through. We'll, we'll try to get our, our patrol officers, if not myself, out there 
uh, and be as descriptive as possible. What kind of vehicle were they driving, license plates, color of the vehicle, male or female. Any detail is very important for us to go out there and try to find out who was driving that vehicle so that we can get to the bottom of it and find out uh, if we can notify the resident and the guest. <clears throat> Moving on to the next subject, we have an issue with uh, lost pets here in the community. <laughs> We recently had another fatality, unfortunately. Uh, over by the Fairway Villas, we had a lost uh, little dog attacked by coyotes. It was not a pretty scene. It is California state law, folks. All dogs need to be leashed. I cannot stress that enough. Leash your dogs, especially if you're in common areas, leash your dogs. Some residents may not know that your dog is a friendly and approachable dog. Their pet may not be comfortable approaching another dog. So we highly recommend that you keep your pets leashed uh, we will respond to those calls. We have made our efforts in going out to those common areas and educating those guests or residents to leash their dogs up. Um, practice that as much as possible, folks. I can't stress that enough. But we've had several dog attacks. We've had residents attacked by dogs, um, and we're trying, we're trying to avoid that. So please be, please be visual when it comes to that uh, situation, okay? Uh, at our gate stations, we try to expedite your guest in as soon as possible. Of course, we don't want to have any lines of traffic at the gates. We want to make sure that everybody comes through in a timely and fashionable manner. In order to avoid that, call in your guests, folks. If you know that you're expecting somebody to come in, whether it be a contractor, a guest, anybody, let us know. We'll be more than happy to put them on your guest list and we'll get them through. We only ask that they have an ID ready so that we can expedite that as soon as possible, an address that they're going to. Um, we'd be surprised how many people show up and say we're here to see the Smith residents. We have a lot of Smiths in the community. It's a very common name. So that's going to hold my officer up and trying to pull up the, the Smith residents and find out which address they're going to go to. It's going to take a little bit more longer of a time. But I do expect my officers to do their due diligence and comply with what needs to get done so that we can get those individuals authorized to come through. If they're not on your list, we're going to give you a call. Our officers will call you ask you if you're expecting a certain individual. If we're not successful in reaching you, we'll park them behind our gates. That means your guest is gonna be waiting for a few minutes until we get a call back from you. So as much as you can, give us a call. If you know you're expecting somebody, we'll put them on the list and we'll get them in as soon as possible. Uh, the city of Banding has been working diligently in repairing a lot of our potholes around the community. We've been getting a lot of calls about potholes inside the community. Um, we are trying our best to uh, get in touch with the city of Banning and let them know that this is becoming an issue. Today, in fact, between gates uh, three and four, they're working on that pothole uh, due to the adverse weather that we had a couple of days ago. What was it last week? Last week. Uh, it was pretty obvious that that needed to be repaired. So we call them out. They'll schedule the individuals to come out. Technicians will be out here and they'll repair it as soon as they can. Uh, but just be careful when you're out on the roads. It's the only thing I can encourage you to do is just keep an eye out and be vigil while you're driving around. Uh, we're continuing to do our perimeter checks outside of the community, not just inside. Uh, we're ex extremely uh, proud of what we've been accomplishing with that. Uh, I know it's been hard for us to drive around outside by the northern part of the community, but we found ways to get out there by the railroad tracks, and we're doing our best to make sure that if there's any suspicious individuals or activities out there, that we're letting them know that we're out there keeping ourselves visual. Residents have been really kind to getting in touch with us as well to let us know that there's individuals that look suspicious. We will respond. Our uh, response time has been really good, significantly good. Uh, we'll try to cut it down to five minutes or less if possible to get to the scene and uh, try to find out what's going on. And we will follow up with the residents as well. Whoever calls us, uh, if you're on the scene, we'll follow up and let you know what our findings were. So if you have any, uh, any issues regarding that, you see something, say something, give us a call, we'll be out there as soon as possible. Uh, we're continuing to doing our garage door checks. We haven't had any incidents, knock on wood, regarding any garage door theft occurrences. So I'm really pleased to say that that's really good in, in our community. We're preventing theft occurrences from happening. So let's keep that uh, in mind. We're gonna continue to do our checks in our perspective and, and continue to push through and calling residents between the hours at 8 p.m. and midnight to notify you about your garage door. Uh, again, get to know your neighbors too. Uh, we're a community. <laughs> we're, we're here as a community and we're here to work with each other. Uh, so if you see your neighbor's garage door open, a simple knock on their door or a phone call will definitely help them uh, get that uh, perimeter secured as well. Um, 
I think that's pretty much it. Parking enforcement's gonna be continued uh, to be done throughout the community. Um, we've been pretty good about issuing citations out to violators out there that are showing expired passes. So if you have guests that are spending the night, make sure they have a valid pass all on their dashboard at all times, okay? Uh, Lieutenant Rome, do you have anything to add on to that? Perfect. Folks, I'm open for questionings. Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'm I, sorry. I've noticed there are a lot of cars parked in driveways overnight. Okay, so residents are allowed to park their driveways uh, on their driveways as long as they have a valid resident pass display on their dashboard. For how long? Uh, the most that we can do is three days and two nights. Uh, residents are limited to a total, total of 60 resident passes per six months, per six months. Uh, Mike, two quick questions. Number one, I walk every morning through Myrtle Beach and Birdie, and it's almost like you're a child again. You have to look both ways. People not only don't stop, they don't even slow down. They go 20, 25 miles an hour through there. And this morning, the lady who I always see there said yesterday, uh, a car ran the stop sign, hit an individual in the crosswalk. The emergency people were called out. Yeah. Is that true? And number two, uh, the green area on Myrtle Beach, there are signs up there, no golf carts allowed on the grass and dogs must be on a leash. For reasons I won't get into, every day I go by that park to, to see what's hap happening. And do you patrol that and ticket these people because they're flagrantly violating the signs and parking their carts on the grass and they let their dogs loose? Great question, so I'm gonna do two part answers to that. The first one, yes, we did have an incident yesterday, unfortunately. Um, it was uh, an incident that happened in the intersection of Myrtle Beach and Birdie, right next to the South Clubhouse. The resident was struck by an on ongoing vehicle that was not paying attention to its surroundings. The resident's okay, to my knowledge. Um, it wasn't fatal. Um, they were taken to San Gregorio, and they're being observed at this time. But PD was working dil dil diligently with uh, AMR and CDF uh, to make sure that the vitals were up, the individual was placed on a stretcher and taken to the hospital, uh, so he was conscious. Thank thankfully, it wasn't as bad. But that is one of our main concerns: is paying attention to you know your surroundings and your speed limits, and making sure that when you get to an intersection, you slow down or com come to complete stop. It's just becoming an issue. Um, perfect example: yesterday, we need to prevent stuff like that from happening inside our community. Um, so yes, it, it is a concern. The second part. We do monitor that area. Uh, we do drive by, and we have had officers go out and make contact with these residents regarding the loose dogs. We do issue citations to those golf carts as well. I like to be fair. Uh, if I come up to you and ask you to please relocate your vehicle, if you can do that right away, then I will avoid giving you a citation. But if you don't comply, and I have to sit there and wait for whenever you're ready to move your vehicle, I will give you a citation. I mean. It's regulations that are clearly there and the signage is there and we're there to just enforce it. Now, I have no authorization to issue a citation for somebody that has not leashed their dogs. That is something that you can discuss with your master board directors and see if maybe that's a recommendation that they're willing to, to have us go through and start holding those individuals accountable. Uh, the person that was hit last night what happens to the person that hits them? Do the police take over then and talk to the driver? Absolutely, the whole scene becomes now uh, a scene that okay. PD is involved and they will do their uh, investigation and, and find out how they're gonna process that. Okay, another thing I happen to know is he is not okay. See, mix of information He's that I'm in getting. He's in Loma Linda yeah. Hospital. In Loma Linda? Yes, okay. and he is in bad shape. Okay, yeah, so just so you guys know, PD does not disclose a lot of information to us. It is a violation to disclose personal information to a third party. I'm sure you guys wouldn't want somebody to have your medical information uh, you know, given to somebody else that right. has nothing to do with you. We just go out there, we're there to observe, we're due to do our reports, and then we'll report back to administration to let them know what took place. If anybody's willing to give us more information that is public information, we will update those reports and let everybody know. But if we don't hear of it, then I don't know what's going on. Okay, I am now going to enter. Thank you, Mike. You're quite Thank welcome, you so boss. much. Thank you. 
We appreciate your information all the time. Keeps us aware of what's going on. I'm now going to introduce Banning PD, and I know I'm going to mess your name up, so I'm not even going to pronounce it. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sergeant Haudegui, Robert Haudegui, Banning Police Department. I supervise the Homeless Liaison Program here in the city of Banning. Um, I just wanted to share a couple stats on our homeless program, what our homeless officer is doing right now. Um, currently for the month of January, he had five felony arrests and 23, correction, six felony arrests and 23 misdemeanor arrests. So that's pretty significant because it's only one officer and he's dealing with the whole city and it's a lot of work. Uh, we continue to work with our partners at uh, CBAT, our mental health therapist, which you guys met last meeting we were here. Janet, she's actually at the station today. I was going to bring her with me. Um, however, we're continuing to work with her to give uh, mental health services to our homeless population or to anyone in the city of Banning. It's not just for the homeless. I know there was a question asked about the Explorers programs. Uh, we actually have an Explorer post here in the city of Banning, and I'm one of the advisors. It is for young men and women ages 14 to 21. 14 to 21, uh, they have to maintain a 2.0, a grade average, no criminal convictions or arrests or anything of that nature. But it's a good mentoring program. I was an Explorer myself growing up, where I grew up in the city of Pomona. I was an Explorer, I was a cadet, and definitely helped me be where I'm at now. And it's prepared me for my career, um, which has been great. And it built a foundation for me when I was in the academy. I was good to go. I, I had a lot of base knowledge, and I really didn't have many issues going through the academy and in my career in law enforcement. So I, I highly encourage the program. That's why I'm a, an advisor. And uh, we do our best to try to mentor these young men and women. We also have cadets. It's, it's a paid position, but you have to be in college. You have to be a high school graduate. Same thing goes uh, background check. You have to be enrolled in at least six units of college and maintain a 2.5 GPA. Again, it's an incentive if you're interested in this field. We have various uh, programs and, and things of that nature for, for the kids and people that are interested. We have kids even from Beaumont coming to, to Banning that live in Beaumont and uh, are explorers with the city of Banning Police Department. Beaumont has an explorer post and uh, California Highway Patrol as well. But Again, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the statistics for our homeless program. Um, as security mentioned, you know, keep doing your garage checks, make sure your cars are locked, everything's well lit in your front yard, your backyard, don't leave anything of value that's visible in your car. Uh, you don't want to, you know, become a victim because it oftentimes is a crime of opportunity. They see something laying out there, a phone, a purse, they're gonna break the window and take it. So with that, I don't have much more. Uh, thank you guys. Oh, questions. Do you want to take questions. questions? Yes, questions. Sorry. Come on, I know somebody. Will. I knew yes, you Linda, would have one. <laughs> Please spell your last name. <laughs> See, I told you we would not be able to do that. J A U R E G U I. Common spelling. Right. <laughs> Robert. Sergeant? Yes, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am. Come on, I know somebody wants to answer, uh, ask a question. How did you? Yes. No one? I am shocked. Thank you guys for your time. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Hold that for me for just a second. So I just want to do a couple of little announcements. Our next program is going to be on Tuesday, March 7th, here in the main ballroom. Uh, from 1 to 3, it is the Red Cross Disaster Preparedness Presentation. Our guest speaker is Gerald Winkle. He is the uh, Disaster Program Manager from the American Red Cross. And so I'm just going to read you this real quick. If I can, I was going to put my glasses on. You are cordially invited to attend this Disaster Preparedness Workshop to help you identify actions to be taken before, during, and after an incident. The presentation will focus on earthquakes and special considerations for older adults. I should have said for mature adults, but some of us aren't mature. You will have the opportunity to sign up for free smoke alarm installation at your residence where a team will visit your home at your convenience to test your existing alarms 
and replace him right away if needed. And again, we always have the Banning PD and Securitas here. This will be a very informational um, presentation, as all of ours have been. And I was going to give you one more little... Um, I do have to put my glasses on for this one. Okay, if you see water le leaks in Sun Lakes or on Sun Lakes Boulevard, you can call the water leak alert number. And that number is 951-849-6296. This is through the city of Banning. And so I just wanted to let you know that we, there is a water leak um, um, number that you can call. 951-849-6296. Also, I have whoever came to the CHP presentation last month, um, your certificates are in the back. And for those of you watching on TV, you can come and pick them up from me. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention? Yes. It's a water leak alert. That's and then the number, yeah, water leak alert mm -hmm, is from the city of Banning. And yes, remember the one that we had between three and four? Yeah, that's that's what you're gonna call. Oh, I also wanted to let you know, and I do have this in my um, um, just one second, CJ. Um, the city of Banning is introducing Drop Counter. It's a new customer water portal. If you don't, you should have gotten this in your water bill. And the drop counter um, app allows you to keep track of your water use, set conservation goals, and receive utility alerts. You can register online or you can download the app on your phone. So um, I know, just one second, CJ. I think it's okay. Well, one of the things I looked on, oh, I know. The leak alert, is it on the banning website? There should be something there that, you know, where you could. I know, but if you don't write down the number, you should be able to go on. Okay. I, I don't know that personally. I know that um, um, Bob had gone to a um, um, meeting with Art Vela, and I think he's the one that gave that number out. But I'm sure you can go on to the water website and find that. But if you just put that in your phone, and um, it will be in my newsletter, so you'll be able to get that information from there. Everything that I've just told you will be in the Lifestyles article, so you'll be able to get that information. I looked online to see if I could get on for that water thing, you know, for that drop counter or whatever. I couldn't find anything online for that. And what they told you in the little thing they handed out really just, it, it, didn't, it didn't work. No, again, they didn't tell us exactly how to do it. Um, I will find out from Art Vela to find out exactly how you get on that drop counter. He did have a presentation, and there was a lady that was at the um, city council meeting, and she was the one that's in charge of the drop counter. She showed exactly how to get on there. So I will try and make sure that I get all that information and get it out to everybody. Any other questions? Beverly, I know you want to ask something. Oh, okay. Do we have any other questions? Well, I thank you for all participating and um, have a great afternoon and thank you.